We are so thrilled to welcome Kai Diekmann, founder of Story Machine, and Walter Smerling, the chairman of Stiftung Kunst and Kultur, to talk to us about digital communications. Like four or five years ago, there were not that amount of emojis uh, that are available uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, but it's really interesting, and it tells something about the power of images. You know, I used to be the editor-in-chief of BUILD, uh, and BUILD uh, means photo, means picture, and BUILD um, uh, used to be, in the analog times, uh, uh, the most powerful and the biggest media brand in Europe, and it's still today. And it's called, for a reason, BUILD, and it's not called text or headline, because uh, it says something about the power of an image um, reaching your, uh, your brain reaching um, your emotion, reaching your heart uh, much faster than you can do with uh, any words. Actually, our brain is not made for reading. Uh, 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 with exception for the Chinese, for the Chinese written language, our brain does not like reading. It, is, uh, it uh, regards reading as an act of working. This is why we try to avoid it. So it's very interesting, for example, um, I don't know if you know the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, and of course, uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung is like the New York Times. No, it's a very um, 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 serious quality newspaper uh, with a lot of text. And the biggest challenge for us as a journalist, and I'm a journalist, is to um, persuade people to actually get into a text and to read it. So what we do, for example, is we examine how do people react to our pages? How do, do they react to the layout? And uh, to those of you who know the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, which is, has got one picture on the front page and the rest is all text. Uh, we um, make experiments with people. We ask them to take on special glasses so that we can see where are they looking at and where are they starting to read. And for example, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung is always the same. People uh, take the first look at the picture and then they go over the whole page, and then they start reading with the three little news uh, on the bottom of the page, simply because our brain tries to avoid reading. Um, uh, and, and if you take a look at yourself, um, uh, it's very much the same. You know, for if I read the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, and there's this big, always this big uh, article on the front page. And if it says something about regional elections in Slovenia, I'm really relieved because I don't have to read it. And if it says, you know, Merkel has got some problems, I say, oh, I have to read it. So for example, one of the tricks we are doing as journalists, um, you see that they are, for this big article, it is made out of two columns. Why? Why isn't it just one column? Because it's try, we are trying to trick the brain. Uh, if it's only wide like 11 Cicero, it gives the brain the impression that it's a short text. And therefore, you are much more willing to start in reading than if it's you know, just a broad text and you have to start working on it. And this is, of course, has very much to do with the power of emoji, uh, emojis because it gives you such a fast idea of what, what is going on. We had actually the issue of ambivalence um, because most of most emojis, they have a specific meaning, uh, like configured by the uh, Unicode consortium. But uh, as we always, we all found out that they, they, those are all ambivalent, and that's actually a thing I um, would like to pose to you, um, because you or you also said that you uh, answered in your uh, interview with emojis. Have you had feedback? Did other people understood what you wanted to say? Um, I'm not sure because it was uh, the classical way, you know, an analog newspaper that is actually published on paper asked me to do this emoji interview. Mm -hmm. So they are addressing an audience uh, that is still in the habit of reading paper. So this is what I uh, uh, call a classical mistake, yeah. you know, because it's, uh, um, um, it's like um, writing about music. You can't hear music. Describing a picture in a newspaper is great because I can see it. But yeah, you have this break. And uh, this is why um, uh, there wasn't a lot of reaction, but it's, uh, again, it's four years ago, five years ago. What I do today sometimes is that if I answer interviews, I still, you know, behind every answer, 
I, you know, I use one emoji you know, to support the idea of what I'm talking about. But you know, uh, if I look, for example, at the uh, communication with my own family, and since uh, I'm here to talk about digital communication, and if I look uh, at our family chat, it's all about emojis. Sure. Yeah. Sure. We had a discussion here amongst ourselves. We've been talking about emojis the whole day. And uh, we tried to bridge it to the corporate and the political world. And people, we had a divided um, opinion actually. Some people said, no, it's not really the right form of communication for political uh, messaging. Um, I think it might be because the new, um, uh, the youth certainly uses emojis. Um, how do you feel about that? Do you think it's something to be taken seriously or do you think it's still something rather for a chit chat, something for the family talk? Like terms, abstract terms like freedom, democracy can be certainly, or like here, diversity. I mean, uh, 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 to be serious, it's not that new. It's new to be created uh, in that uh, abundance. Uh, but, you know, to have like a symbol of something, uh, uh, call it emoji, like the peace emoji, has always been there. And uh, in a time when we still were analog and had no uh, uh, chances, you know, to display emojis uh, like on our phones, you know, you would have them like badges, you would have them on t-shirts. So the, the communication through something that is yeah, simply a kind of symbol um, is not really new. Yeah. It's something that has been developed out of things that have already been there. But what do you think about the, com uh, the combination? Because we were actually exploring how, how, can, how can we form complex uh, meanings with the combination of already existing emojis. Because there's some kind of power in it. You have the single, uh, let's say, peace emoji, but the combination with all the others uh, and also the surrounding makes actually a really complex message, m which might be ambivalent, but uh, that's actually a road we, we think is really interesting to start a dialogue and not to be precise to a specific thing, but actually to open up a dialogue, which is like <laughs> an open book sometimes. It's probably an interesting experiment to create something like an international language. Yeah, sure. An international language that, uh, uh, that doesn't need any translation, because you know it is yeah. known internationally, and it's the consequence out of uh, globalization that we have, yeah. that we share, since we share the same platforms, yeah. uh, we share the same communication tools as well, yeah. and this is simply part of a communication tool, and uh, makes a lot of sense. You know, on the other side, you know there are a lot of um, uh, magazines nowadays that display Rätsel of English. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> Rätsel. Rätsel. Uh, a quest. A, new challenge. a challenge. challenge, a yeah. challenge, you know, where they, for example, translate a uh, famous sentence or a famous meeting or a film title into emojis. Yeah. And you have to translate it back. You have to understand what it is it about. Star Wars in emojis, right? But yes. uh, Star Wars, they, uh, yeah. they translated it yeah. in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. So it's about becoming a, a new language. Uh, we have to understand that it has got very much to do with uh, generation. Uh, because uh, the way you use media uh, has got very much to do with your DNA. The way to use media actually is going into your bloods. And if, you, um, um, if you're young and if you grow up with this kind of communication, it's intuitive and you don't have to explain it. Whereas to other generations that grow up with, you know, uh, with letters, with pictures, uh, with analog headlines, uh, it is something that is quite away from them and they have to learn it. Mm -hmm. It's not intuitive. So my parents use emoji so much more than I do because they are so maybe fascinated by the concept. I don't know if you know it, but in WhatsApp groups, the older people tend to really explore the diversity of uh, emojis that are available, whereas I always use the same five emojis probably. So I don't know if it's really, uh, um, of course, the usage or the close, uh, close closeness to uh, the digital media is different for a younger generation, but 
I think generally it's only a symbol, right? It's just a transportation of emotions um, that are maybe not transported by words itself. But I don't know if it's really a generation. Uh, I gap. use emojis very often because simply I'm lazy. You know, and uh, it's, uh, you, you, you know the other one is seeing that you saw what he is writing. And I don't, you don't want to do any writing. And uh, therefore, you know, it's a kind of a lazy reduction as well. And for example, my wife, she hates it if I just answer with emojis. She wants me to write words and not just to do it. And she declines to answer if I'm just doing emojis. It, yeah, it's a reduced uh, communication, very much reduced. It's not, you know. There's also research about it to, to have it actually um, as some kind of replacement for not having the time and the energy to uh, come up with a long explanation of emotion of emotions. Yeah. So it's shortcut actually. What about making abstract terms more clear, like um, energy transformation or democracy? Is that do you see emojis being a good tool for that or for for climate change, for example? These terms are very complex. Could you see an opportunity maybe to explain complex issues on a more in a more simple way? Um, I, I think that's very difficult because you know the uh, the meaning of the emojis to explain a uh, uh, um, complex situation is quite difficult. But simply to use emojis to um, attract attention, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, if I want to reach out to a younger generation uh, that has actually been living with emojis as part of their communication tools. It doesn't make any sense to spare them out. You know, to address a younger audience with black and white pictures may be difficult, or with silent movies may be difficult. Uh, um, and it has to do with, it's a way of storytelling. You know, uh, if we talk about, for example, let's say the opera. Um, opera is nothing else than storytelling. I want to tell a story. So, uh, for example, if I go to Bayreuth, uh, Bayreuth is the place where they uh, actually have the Wagner every year. And uh, Wagner is nothing doing but simply doing telling stories. Uh, and me was my 57 years music. Uh, music and you're much younger than me. I'm one of the youngest guys in the audience with 57 years. So you see that you know, it's for a younger generation it's much more difficult to understand uh, these kind of communication tools then it is for them to understand digital communication tools. So again, I, I'm convinced it has to do um, uh, something, it has to do with um, a generational thing as well. On the other side, you know, it is much more complex to understand, for example, music in ways of storytelling, to understand Shakespeare. Uh, I, I just saw the other day uh, The Tempest, uh, with Helen Mirren by Shakespeare. It's really complex. And therefore, of course, it's much more attractive to use communication tools that are more easy, but make it difficult to be complex, to differentiate. My question kind of builds on what you just said. So emojis, or in general, digital communication, uh, mostly has the effect of making something complex less complex. A lot of times. And you also said before that p reading is regarded as work for our brain. So, and you've worked as a journalist, now you work kind of as a spin doctor for Story Machine, so you've seen both sides and you've always re uh, reported on politics. Now we have election campaigning in Germany and I feel like in general, not only in Germany but everywhere in the world, we have a world where problems get more and more complex, globalization, everything's connected. Not, the people are not getting smarter at the same time, so they understand all the complexity. And now we have like an election campaign that is kind of, everything is just on the surface. It's about short messages being put out on Twitter that are successful or not, and then people are uh, being criticized for it or not. Um, and when it comes to really concrete politics and policies to solve problems, we don't really know. If you would ask people on the street what are the solutions to this concrete problem by this party, by this candidate, they wouldn't know. So I wonder if this whole thing of digitalization, of uh, emojis, of whatever, um, reduces the complexity in a way that in the end 
um, whoever gives the easiest answers or is best in communicating them um, might win the votes, uh, even though the more complex and more, well, complicated answers that are harder to communicate might be the better answers. Um, uh, I'm afraid you're right. First of all, um, uh, actually, the uh, um, challenges are getting more complex. And um, uh, for example, when I was at your age, when I was a teenager, many things were, uh, you know, many things were much more easy. You know, uh, when when I uh, started um, uh, being a professional, I didn't have much choices to take. You know. Uh, I would be in the Rentenversicherung and that's it. Nowadays you have to take choices for yourself that are extremely complex and that will have an effect 40 years later. So with globalization and digitization, many challenges after, by the way, uh, the Cold War as well. You know, the Cold War simply divided the world in black and white. And so many things were so easy. You were on the evil side or you were on the good side. And now it became very different, you know, uh, regarding the conflict with China. Are we still on the side of the Americans? No, because we've got probably different uh, 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 interests and it is extremely complex. On the other side, people don't like complex challenges. People love simple answers. People love a clear guidance. People love uh, somebody to tell them what to do and where to go. And you know, this is not really something new. This is a kind of psychology that's always been there. For example, uh, uh, what is part of the success of BUILD is the, you know, the, uh, to try to make things as simple as they could be uh, and to, to take um, complexity out of uh, uh, topics. And uh, by the way, that is something that is really complicated. It's hard because the hardest thing, you know, that famous letter from Goethe to a friend. He said, uh, my dear friend, uh, this is going to be a long letter because I don't have time. Uh, it's much more difficult to, you know, to, uh, to be short on something because if you really got into something and know what it's about, it's quite easy then to talk in short information. And the more you tell about a problem, the less you have understood it. So um, that is a challenge and the... Um, digital world, and especially the platforms, uh, don't make it easier. And this is one of the, uh, uh, the things that really um, uh, made me uh, trying out something different than journalism. You know, I've been journalism for uh, more than half of my life, for 31 years. And I've been editor-in-chief altogether for over 18 years. Um, first Welt am Sonntag and then Bild, uh, uh, Bild Zeitung. What was my job? as a editor-in-chief. I was the gatekeeper. I was the one who decided at the end uh, who is going to have access to a mass audience, uh, which message is going to have recognition by a mass audience. Because I was the one that would invite people, give an interview, uh, tell your opinion. So in the old world that was existing till like 20, 15 years, uh, 15, 20 years ago, you either need a TV station or you need a printing factory to actually reach out to a mass audience. And this has totally changed with social media, totally. From one day to the other, you don't need these tools anymore because the tools are there for everybody. Everybody can be his own publisher. Uh, what used to be a TV station is now um, a YouTube or Facebook Live. What used to be a newspaper, a magazine, is nowadays Twitter um, or um, uh, uh, Facebook or Instagram. Um, and if you really use these tools in a professional way, it's an extreme powerful tool. But uh, with some downsides. And I'm just talking about simply to recognize what's going to happen. By the way, who was or who is the guy that used these tools for himself most successful in the whole world? Donald Trump, of course. Without, Trump, uh, without Twitter, Trump uh, never had become candidate or, or president because neither the New York Times or CNN, uh, biggest media outlets in the US, would ever take him seriously or giving him the chance and the presence to you know, uh, convince people as a candidate and as um, a president. At the end, Trump 
on Twitter had like 88 million followers. This is as much as New York Times and CNN on the, chain, on the same channel combined. And this shows how much power there is in social media. The problem is with social media that social media is not an instrument um, that is made to make the world a better place, but it's simply about data collection. So their interest, uh, the interest of uh, Facebook or Twitter is not to give as much recognition to your message uh, um, uh, as possible, but to take in the user on the platform as long as possible, to get as much data out of him, to learn as much as possible about him, and then to sell this data. And this means that the algorithm at the end um, um, feeds a kind of content that is hopefully emotional, that is um, disputed, uh, that is controversial, uh, that is simple. Because this is the kind of stuff that you know, really attracts people. So, um, of course, the algorithm of Facebook, if you do a long uh, 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 article about the challenges in the education program of the Balkans for the next 20 years, uh, that kind of content wouldn't get as much recognition as something stupid. And that is the problem with these new platforms because the algorithm has got nothing to do with actually the need of society to do the way our discourse we need to do it. It was, what was the job of media in the classical way? We were the ones that organized the dialogue of society about itself. How do we want to live together? And to create a kind of hierarchy of topics as well. So there was always a man-made hierarchy. And even if you would not read, even if and would never together, if you do not read uh, Deutschlandfunk, if you do not read the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, if you do not watch Tagesschau every night, you could not avoid uh, recognizing what are the main topics people are talking about in Germany. Because somehow you would get the same idea because, you know, journalists, at the end there's a hierarchy. And this is difficult with the new platforms because there's no hierarchy. Because the newsfeed is not interested into a valuable topic, into an important topic, but into a popular topic. And on the one side. So we've got the situation that although there are important topics, it may be something totally different that makes it to the surface of the platform. You all know that uh, uh, example of Bucket Challenge a couple of years ago when Bucket Challenge was so overwhelmingly that no other topic made it to, uh, uh, to the front. And the other thing is that what is really important for society is that we've got common topics we talk about that we know what is important. And in a situation where the, uh, the algorithm creates that one single news feed, which is individualized for everybody, personalized, we don't share any topics anymore. And that is extremely dangerous for a society where we've got so many uh, common topics we should uh, talk about. And if you now look at the reality of the numbers, and this is my last uh, remark, and this is why I'm uh, convinced it is such a Zeitenwende, such a uh, change of paradigm. What is still the most successful TV station in Germany? ZDF. ZDF. Public TV, ZDF, is still the most successful TV station uh, in Germany because of me. I am born in 1964. I'm the most German. There are no more Germans than from the ones born in 1964. And we grew up with a certain way of watching TV, linear TV. What is the percentage of young people under the age of 20 watching ZDF? 5%? 0.8%. But only if you count live football in. If you count live so soccer out, you can't measure it anymore. Um, uh, people under the age of 30 watching ZDF? 3%. And this shows it's, you know, totally gone. And, um, you know, I've got kids, of course we are watching TV, but we don't have any idea of what's going on in the linear program. We are watching uh, Netflix, we are watching uh, Apple TV, but nobody, nobody had the idea of watching 
leave me a program. I remember a situation where my 14-year-old boy called me and the Wi-Fi was down. And he said, Papa, ich bin voll das Opfer. And now I have to watch TV and I have to watch what they want me to watch. He couldn't get the idea that he you know, was forced to have a certain uh, programmatic schedule that he was buying to. And this shows how much of, you know, has changed in the way generations consume media. Um, the younger generations, and we are talking about the millennials, and the millennials are no teenagers anymore. They turned 40 last year. You won't see them near a kiosk anymore, buying something on paper. And they don't even go to a website to actually search for information, because the algorithm turns totally changed the way of getting informed. You don't have to look something up. You know, I learned how I can decode a newspaper. I would never read a newspaper every single letter from the upper left to the top down right. But, you know, uh, the um, average newspaper reader takes out like 10% of the content of a newspaper that is interesting and relevant to him. If your content is simply shown in the newsfeed, everything you see over there is relevant to you. And what you don't see over there it's really irrelevant and you don't look it up. And this way of media consumption totally changes the way of how we are informed and about what we are informed. One question back. You describe the problem, very complex, but can you give me a built answer, so short and concrete? What is the solution to get complexity into on the agenda? Um, honestly, I don't know. It's hard, right? Yeah. And nobody in Iraq, no, no, media, yeah. politicians, yeah. no one has a solution. Yeah, and, and the problem is, you know, it's our own psychology. It is what we as human beings like and dislike. And first of all, um, there's nothing human beings are more interested in than other human beings. Very simple, because, you know, I want to reflect myself, I want to know uh, uh, am I crazy? Am I stupid? You know, it's since we were um, uh, living on that big tree uh, with all the other apes, we haven't changed much. You know, that is how we develop, by the way, our language. You know, because we were doing this on the big tree, and this was the first way to exchange information. What is happening on the big tree? Who is climbing up? Who is falling down? And who is trying to break? You know, uh, some of the things. This is how we developed language to exchange information. Uh, but evolution is not as fast as technology. So people are interested in other people. Um, uh, this is why it is so, you know, this is why political parties no, talk about people, because I want to know how, how, how is it ticking? And, and you, you can't trick out human psychology. I, I would like to bring in uh, Rizzo, for example, because I think uh, he, he does uh, the videos like uh, the Zerstörung von CDU and so, and so on. And I think this is some kind of linear structure coming into the parallel universe of the, uh, of, of the internet actually. Because when he does one video, a lot of people watch it and they talk about it. And then something like this linear structure you were talking about is getting back, I would say. What do you think? Um, uh, he's a phenomenon what you sometimes have, uh, that there's a big topic. Uh, actually, that was a, a piece of media history uh, because Rezo became so big uh, in regards of uh, the CDU reacting to an event in the digital world uh, with the handbook for analog communication. Uh, and they really made it big. And that is why he became a star and that is why he's got the chance uh, to reach out uh, to people over there. Um, um, I'm not sure if, it, if linear uh, really has got a chance. Everything that is human is analog. And um, we tick analog. So there are some things that won't change as fast as technology is changing. And um, still, uh, till we are still at the totally beginning of the digital world. You know, um, Angela Merkel once said, uh, it's Neuland. And everybody was laughing about her. She is correct. It is Neuland. What we did with the digital world is a revolution. The digitization is more than uh, the invention of the dampf machine 
electrification and automatization together. We created a new world. We created a second world. The digital world is a world where the physical laws of our existing world are not true anymore. I, I, would, I would go a step further and say they are creating us because now I think the digital world is even shaping our opinions or shaping the way we think. I don't, um, I don't know, a a am I scared? No, I'm not scared. It's a big chance and it's about, um, it's about exploring. You know, we, we simply recognize, you know, for, uh, as I said, you know, time doesn't play any role in the digital world. Distance doesn't play any role. I can send a uh, information within one second around the world and have an effect on the other side of the world. You know, we learned how we should behave in this analog world. You know, if uh, I'm now uh, hitting you, don't do it. I know how fast I have to run so that you don't get me and beat me up. I know how to move. And I know, for example, if you throw that bottle at me, I know where I have to go to. We don't know how to move in that new digital world. We have to learn it, simply to learn it. But we are totally, totally at the beginning um, of that journey and I think we have to learn an awful lot of things we have to learn how to communicate and we have to find solutions for these topics uh, but we uh, we can't trick out the human uh, psychology there are one things some there's a nice observation the other day you know at the beginning of the 80s uh, digital watches were extremely popular the ones you know that simply would show uh, the exact time but since we are analog beings, the exact time is not enough for us. We want to see it that way. You know, we want to see the time span. Now, because at the end, as an analog being, time span, linear time span, is relevant for us. Uh, well, uh, first of all, just I, it's more common just because I'm in Germany and uh, it. Uh, the, the, I just remember with your talk about how people compared uh, the rise of social media and online communications with the Reformation or the, 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 impre the inventing of the printing press and how that led to you know, the ideas of Martin Luther spreading, etc. So that's just a minor comment of that came to mind and the, the how much like historians say that the Reformation might not have taken, taken place if it were not for the printing press. So you have the, you know, the, the tools, the new tool, and the ideas that you know, it, it helps spread, and how it sort of led to you know, a lot of disruption. So as you said, we're at the beginning, and uh, you know, I think we, don't, we, we cannot see where this is leading to, but certainly we see a bit of disruption, and uh, we certainly um, you know, have this perception that you know, the digital communications make our society be more in flux and in perpetual change. And just, um, you know, as you said, um, newspapers, journalists that used to be the gatekeepers, the ones who could sort of could give structure to this um, massive amount of ideas that are roam around society. So, and th there was this debate, right, when the rise of Trump, so how would the New York Times or some serious newspaper cover uh, the Trump campaign or the Trump, Trump presidency. So how do you see that newspapers and journalists have to react to this new uh, to report? Uh, do you have to quote a tweet of a politician, make it a story, or is it not enough? You need to delve deeper. Uh, you need to change the story around. How do you see it? First of all, you're totally right. Uh, you can compare the invention uh, of the social media platforms to the invention of uh, book publishing. And what happened 500 years ago is very much the same. You suddenly would say an awful lot of you know, uh, um, documents and uh, pamphlets against the orthodoxy of the Catholic Church because you know, they had no chance to them to express themselves because, you know, um, uh, announcement and giving recognition to other ideas were in different hands. So it is kind of repeating itself um, at that point. Um, it's difficult. The problem is, you know, in a world where everybody can insinuate himself and draws 
his own picture, the necessity for independent journalism becomes bigger. You know, so for example, you know, uh, one of the football clubs, uh, Bayern Munich, Bayern Munich, they were the first ones, you know, to do their own interviews. You know, they would interview themselves. And that's a great idea because, you know, if I do interviews with myself, you know, they are so much better than when I ask all these silly questions by somebody from Spiegel Süddeutsche Zeitung. And I would only ask myself, you know, why are you so innovative? You know, why are you so creative? Uh, and all these kind of good questions I never get asked. So in a time where everybody can be his own incinator, uh, we need independent journalists who simply check that incination in a world where many people see that incination. The problem with independent journalism is the business model. Are people willing to pay for it? And that is one of the biggest questions uh, we have not found an answer yet. And there are very different answers in very different uh, countries. There are um, the big foundations that sometimes finance independent journalism. Uh, there are countries like in Austria where this government gives help and support to newspapers, which I think is awful. Uh, but the biggest challenge is um, how are we going to pay for independent journalism? Is it not only also finding the attention of the people? Because we are already consumed by the outrage economy, we are consumed by, um, by scandals, by social media um, highlights, and do we actually have time and are we still taking the time to read independent, independent journalism about topics and about issues. Uh, yeah, probably we have to understand that uh, the future of journalism looks very different from what we are used to. It's probably not these big media outlets uh, that aggregate uh, dozens and hundreds of journalists and create one product, but it's, for example, people like Gabor Steingart, and uh, people who are from Germany may know him. He used to be one of the really famous uh, journalists of Der Spiegel, and he created his own media, uh, the uh, famous uh, Steingart's Morning Briefing, uh, which is simply distributed on social media and as a newsletter, and where he is simply doing under his name, meanwhile he hired a couple of journalists, uh, under his name he is creating a new form of journalism, which I think is extremely interesting and um, could be an, uh, a great experiment. Um, the good news, the good news for journalists is, you know, if you're a journalist, what it's about, it's about storytelling. You want to tell stories. Um, the um, digital world gives us much more tools, much more interesting tools to tell our stories. You know, um, I always told my colleagues at Bild, uh, when we, you know, reinvented Bild, and it was always called Bild Zeitung, Bild Paper. And I said, you know, uh, we're not in the paper business. We are not in the dead tree industry. We're in the st storytelling industry. And paper is a very limited platform. It's limited in the space. It's limited in its ways of expression. No sound, no moving pictures. And in the new digital world, we've got all these tools. We can tell our stories in every regard we want. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with every single thing we want to do it. And that is why we have to reinvent the way we are telling our stories. As a journalist today, um, you have to be where your customers are. And if your customers are on TikTok, if your customers are on Facebook, you have to be there. Otherwise, you won't be successful. By the way, I think uh, TikTok is a fascinating platform. To, for example, you know, to, especially to, to explain to a certain audience complicated issues. And um, uh, again, people from, the, from Germany, they probably heard about a guy called Der Anwalt on TikTok. is doing a great job explaining complicated topics to a young audience. I just talked to a banker um, of a big um, uh, DAX bank company. And we're talking about why doesn't he go to TikTok and it explain to a young audience what is a credit? Uh, what is a deposit? What is, an, uh, what is a share? Because, you know, there's no financial education at all in Germany. And, and simply to use these new tools, these new platforms, where you know there is this audience to reach out to ever whom you want to reach out. Mm -hmm. Isn't this some kind of grassroots journalism? Like, uh, 
journalism that grows from the community? Is it actually possible? Because I think there will be a lot of bullshit and a lot of like crap <laughs> in, in this structure, but may, maybe there is something in it. Yeah, I'm totally uh, uh, convinced. So, for example, when I'm talking about the future of uh, local journalism, um, I think you have to use the community in regards to be successful. So uh, I believe in local journalism because in a world that gets more complicated, in a globalized world, what is actually happening around me is becoming more and more relevant. And you know, this is something that has to do with our psychology again. It's very normal that my kids are more interested in the killed rabbit uh, in our garden than probably into a, a, a plane that crashed somewhere in Africa. It has simply to do with, since we are analog uh, um, um, beings, we want to know what's happening in, in our surroundings. So, local journalism can never be substituted by any technology. You need somebody to go there and actually tell me what's, what's happening in my community. So, um, who knows, who, who's the best informed uh, in Potsdam where I live. Of course the journalists of the Potsdamer Neuesten Nachrichten. They know everything that is important in Potsdam. And I'm living in a place in Potsdam in a quarter of the town that's called Berliner Vorstadt. Who knows best about Berliner Vorstadt? Of course the people that are living there. Uh, and that is why for example I think um, as a um, media company you should really try and activate the community uh, in a kind of grassroot to really to become experts on what is happening on the ground. You know there are uh, uh, models in, in, um, in the United States uh, talking about sports. Um, is there anybody from the United States here? Uh, Sport Block Nation. Sport Block Nation is this kind of grassroots uh, journalistic organization. The idea is very simple. Um, they said, you know, as a media outlet, um, take the San Francisco Chronicle. The San Francisco Chronicle has got probably um, three or four sport reporters left. How should they cover all the sport activities in deaths in the city? And it's the 49ers in San Francisco, right? Is it 49ers? So who knows who best about the 49ers? The fans of the 49ers. They know everything. So how can we activate them? And then they found out, you know, the best um, uh, guys to address is um, divorced lawyers in the age of their early 40s. Because they've got enough time, uh, they are idle, they know how to write, uh, they want to get recognition, and they want to get access to the 49ers. So they, uh, they build a system where they ask them to write, and then they have a community that votes who's doing best, and suddenly they create a kind of journalistic production machine that gets them great content really deep into the subject. But isn't it like the self-interview you were like, like the self-interview that, that you that you were, t were telling like you ask yourself the questions that, that are good for yourself isn't it the same? No it's not the same because um, they really report things and since it is um, then um, uh, regarded by others, by the community. They say, I like that information, I don't like that information. You get a really good picture, so it doesn't make any sense, you know, simply to tell what you like about them, but really to tell what is going on. I agree with you. Uh, my parents buy the local newspaper, even though it's the worst, just because of the local news. But uh, one Which one is it? The Westerwälder Zeitung. It's really not good. It's part of the Rhein Zeitung, the Mantel part. But anyways, um, you said one more thing. Of course, journalism is about uh, narrative and storytelling. But you also mentioned that in times of social media, the algorithms and the filter bubbles and all of that play a bigger role. And one thing that is happening is that emotions, since we need them to get attention, are playing a bigger role. You've seen it in the US a lot. I mean, CNN and Fox News are both parts of the same metal being, they, they emotionalize a lot. I would say, yeah, storytelling is a job of journalists, but the first job is to inform people and not to already form their opinion, but leaving that process to the people themselves, unless it's an opinion piece. So, but what's happening now is that more and more it gets into that emotion part, which gets into a society that is already more divided than ever before and we know everything that happens in the US comes over here uh, a few years later and I mean I would say 
Twitter made Trump possible, but also the social division in the US made Trump possible. So the question is, and, and we see it on both sides, we see like bad guys uh, using that social division, but then also we see other uh, news outlets who try to, let's say, raise people for the better, like the ZDF alre already gendering in their news uh, cast, even though 70% of Germans are against uh, uh, that process. So, so the qu about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I don't want to get into that. I just wanted to use that as an, as an example, but you know where I'm going at. So this whole thing of wh where, how do you see the, the responsibility of journalism or communication itself? Um, of course, we don't want to cause social division, but at the same time, we want to get the attention and then we want to inform. So there's this whole process and a lot of conflicts in between. And right now, I'm feeling like it's rather going in the wrong direction than into the right direction. I don't know. First of all, uh, one thing is not the responsibility of journalism, that is education. I don't want to educate people and to tell them how they have to behave and what they have to think. That is not our, um, uh, that is not our job. Um, how, what is truth? You know, if, you, if we are talking about we have to tell the people the truth. There no is, there, is there a truth? Is there one truth? Or are there different ways how you can view a topic? I find it extremely difficult to talk about truth, because truth can be so different. What is the right approach to come as near to the truth as possible? Is it about rational arguments and facts, or is it about emotion? Um, when I try to explain the difference between Bild and Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, I say, you know, um, the idea of Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung is that um, human beings are rational and are reacting and acting according to rational thoughts. And this is how they, you know, create the hierarchy of their news. Uh, we at Bill think totally the opposite. We think it's all about emotion. Projects fail or work because of emotions. People like each other or they don't work with each other. And uh, it's the old history that's uh, it's the old story, does history happen or is history made by man? I totally believe in the latter, it's made by man. And um, as you know, or probably don't know, um, I, I had a quite close relationship uh, with Helmut Kohl and had the chance to uh, write one book with him about reunification. And the whole story of that reunification from June 89 till uh, uh, October 3rd, 1990 has got a, <laughs> simply only to do with emotion and because people could trust each other, trust. Some, uh, trust is something you can't create uh, by intellectual uh, rationalism, but it is, has got something to do with emotions. Uh, and therefore, I think that emotional approach, an emotional journalistic approach to topics sometimes bring you nearer to what may be the truth than any other approach. But, you know, um, still, I don't know if it's anger, but um, it's about trying to understand how does somebody tick. And it has got nothing to do like and dislike with arguments. Very often with arguments, you know, it's most of the time it's the most, the, the best projects that fail because two people, it doesn't work. And you can't explain it in a rational way because they, then it doesn't work between them. Empathy drives communication. Remember? Yeah, it's, it's true. We actually made that experiment with diversity. If you look behind you, there, those are eight different um, interpretations of the word diversity, just. So do you think that emojis in some sort of way um, could maybe help us in understanding or sharing a truth? Because as you said, there are different perspective on perspectives on truth. So maybe we need some visual support to, to get on a common denominator, especially when it's about abstract terms. By the way, there's a great uh, um, a Turkish arti artist, Ahmet Günestikan. Uh, and he's working uh, with, he's doing uh, these kind of mirrors. 
and he's working with kind of emojis as well if he's talking about diversity. So he's using the cross, he's using uh, um, all these different religious symbols. And if you look at his art, you find some similarities, very interesting similarities. Ahmed Gunestikan, you will find him on, um, uh, on um, Instagram. I think, you know, um, at the end, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of art. It's, you know, it's a different way to um, um, attract people's attention and to try to communicate something, to have a different view on it. And, you know, um, this is what we want to do. We want to disrupt people's behavior and we want to disrupt people's view on some things. We want to try to get them to have a different view. This is the idea of art. Yeah, uh, it's a different way of storytelling and uh, have a different view. And in that regards, these um, emoji creations uh, work fantastic, really great. Can you maybe show Kai the others we've done? Because we um, created a few terms in emoji mandalas and um, with the hope that we maybe bring some common denominator on understanding each other. And especially with us moving in our own filter bubbles, I think it's so, in, it's so important to, to get that common ground. So this is um, democracy, mobility, what was that? Uh, I think it's, I think this is also mobility in the second version. Or okay, something. it's quite ambiguous sometimes. Uh, freedom, okay. Freedom of movement for life. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's also stuff we had. That was from the audience. Ah, yeah. Education. Ah, yeah. Diplomacy. What was it? Fake. Fake. <laughs> Fake news, maybe? Yeah. Um, decarbonization, which is also a very abstract term. So I think to, to have some um, emojis or some visual pictures to support these terms, it, it's a great way to communicate um, complex issues, I think. Um, this is... I think this was a refugee thing, right? Refugee. And I think this is, uh, this is because we had uh, several approaches how th these emoji grants are made. Because you always have the surrounding and then um, we had different, uh, let's say, strategies how to explain something. And this is a good example. It comes actually from here. So somebody goes somewhere and this is the, the target where to go to. And actually this is some kind of storytelling from this side on. And then this is the, this is the aim. And there's different strategies how people actually uh, try to tell stories with this really simple tool. And it's uh, put together like a mandala. A mandala is a religious symbol. And you know, religion used symbols to communicate in Christianity and in, in Islam and all the major um, religions. Symbols play a major role to transmit messages. On? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Can you? Uh, uh, Maxine? This, uh, so okay, yeah, we let you guess maybe this time. What do you, what can you see here? That's unfair. <laughs> <laughs> it's no trap. Promise. I see the, uh, little huts. I see the Russian matryoshka. I see the, is it a symbol of the world? Tell me. It's more of a cage. What was the term you wanted to? Um, personal space. Sure. So, uh, yeah. You know, but it actually shows how, uh, what kind of a chance it is to, to do experiments with it because, you know, it's a challenge to the one who is in front of it, and he has to decode. And art is about decoding. I have to understand why, what, what does the artist wants to tell me? What is the idea behind it? And um, to decode these kind of uh, 
um, emoji art pieces is fascinating. It's great. Hi, can I ask you a question? Or are we still? It's me. Sure. Yeah. So I think uh, building on what Simon had said, and, and, and I think yourself as well, there is a growing concern in terms of um, how we communicate and how accurate the, the information that we communicate is. And that is because um, individuals have more access to or more power in the way that they present themselves. They have their own channels, like Donald Trump, or like like you were saying, like the the, the German football team, the Bayern de Munich. Um, they have their own channels, and they can present themselves or the messages that they want in the way they want. So my concern is that sometimes, that for example, at work, I have to push to get the t the complex answers right to to problems. And how do you think we can create in a space where we can get that and that people that we need answers from are comfortable sharing those answers instead of like using their own channels to present themselves in the way they want. How do we cross that barrier and make and ensure that and try to get that information from them, right? And answer the questions, the tough questions. How do we do this? First of all, um, I'm involved in a project uh, of a foundation that tries to promote generous listening. Uh, we all have to learn again to listen to each other, which becomes a really challenge. You know, people want to express themselves, uh, but we are not really skilled in the art of listening. And this is something that I think becomes more and more important because listening is the first step to understand the other. And we don't listen anywhere. Um, second, uh, to be very um, uh, practical, I mean, there are platforms where you've got uh, these uh, exchange of information and talking about more uh, complex things. For example, um, you were talking about my company, Story Machine. We advise people on where um, they should express themselves, where they should communicate. Um, for example, <coughs> I really like sometimes the discussions on, on LinkedIn because LinkedIn um, is a kind of platform where people at least um, try to listen to each other. And you've got the um, chance to be quite specific on topics. Uh, you can create um, the crowd that you want to talk to. And um, I see, you know, some of the guys from Merck and others are really doing a great job over there. Yeah, like for example, <coughs> I work for the nonprofit sector in like democracy area, and the people I talk to on a regular basis, they are aware of the issues. I don't need to convince them. I don't need to to try to explain the complex issues to them. It's about more mainstream. Obviously, there are like podcasts, like special podcasts or like a special newspapers or all of that that will go into. Um, the complexity of like global challenges that we are all facing. But in terms of how do we translate that into more mainstream um, when more people are seeking like the simple answers? That's the reason, for example, for Trump's success or Bolsonaro's success, all of, of that. So I was just wondering, like in your experience, because you obviously have more experience on the communication sector, how do you create that space to transmit, to, to, to share those key messages to a wider audience, I guess? First of all, you always have to define the audience. Yeah, because simply to say it's a wider audience, um, you have to understand why do I want to communicate, what is my goal, and what is the right audience. And then I have to define that audience. To give you an example, uh, we uh, work with one CEO who had like uh, 660,000 employees. And um, he had to tell them that what they have been doing for the last 120 years, building cars, is not going to be the business model of the future. And he was not talking about his products. He was not talking about any clients. He simply had to get the idea into his company that everything we have been uh, incentivized for for the last 120 years is not worth anything in the world of tomorrow. And so his uh, uh, audience was totally defined and he had a real goal. So he was always talking about transformation, transformation. We have to reinvent ourselves. Um, sometimes to get attention uh, broad attention uh, in a mass audience, you have to simplify your message. 
and you have to find a symbol. Um, there was a, uh, and then you can create recognition for a topic. Um, you know, the, the, probably the most known example is a uh, young girl called Greta Thunberg, who simply sat down in front of the parliament with, you know, something like this. And uh, that made a great movement that created an awful lot of attention for a topic. And honestly, talking about four years ago, we wouldn't have talked so much about climate. And climate is always in the big news right now. And of course, in expert talks as well. Um, so you've got, you got different audiences. You want to create attention, simply to create an interest into the topic. If you start to uh, try to convince people to get into a complicated uh, 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 a discussion about complicated uh, detailed questions, you will fail. First of all, you have always to try to find a reason why is this important and what is these, how can I, you know, cut it down to one message where, you know, it uh, gets people's attention and they understand it. Uh, Bill Clinton, uh, it's the economy, stupid. You know, sometimes it's so simple. Um, sorry. I wanted to ask you, um, we talked about these gatekeepers, the big newspapers. Um, what is about like the accountability that might be needed in this uh, time of distraction? Uh, when we talk about this like smear campaign against uh, the Green Party and Alina Baerbock, where there is a, where, where, the, where there's this um, idea to have a message, not have a discussion about a message, but to create a very negative picture, in the way of like, like um, bring this visual of Moses up with this like ten um, like negative things uh, that might come. What do you think about the accountability of news outlets to decide um, if such thing can happen in their advertisement block or not? Uh, very simple. Um, the editorial team never has to do anything with what is being published on the business side. Uh, the company itself has to decide. A CEO has to decide, are we going to take that advertisement? For example, my company, uh, Axel Springer, we decided a long time ago that we won't take uh, any advertisement, any political advertisement, neither from the left-wing party nor from the RFD party. We simply decided to do so. The public TV, uh, for example, they can't choose what kind uh, uh, of uh, 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 political advertisement they have to broadcast because they have got a legal obligation uh, that they have to broadcast from every party that is on that sheet. They have, it, it can be as stupid as it is. They have to find legal reason why they would say, you know, you are breaking a law over here. No? Uh, if you're denying the Holocaust or whatever, you're breaking a law. Uh, but they have to broadcast the biggest idiot shit they get from these uh, parties as long as they are on the legal list. Um, so it's never ever the topic of an editorial team to decide about anything that is done on the, uh, on the business side. Because this is really important, you know, to have this division between the two departments. Because then it becomes, uh, uh, we are not independent anymore. I remember once, uh, I was called very early in my days as editor-in-chief of Build. I was called from the business side that they had won a new uh, um, um, car client that wanted, I don't know, Toyota or whatever, that wanted to publish his first advertisement on page six, like half a page. And they simply asked me to have that in mind in regards of what I'm doing, you know, in the editorial field over there. A every car accident I could get on that day, I would put on that page. Every single car accident. Simply to tell him and get the message, do not ever try again to interfere with the editorial side on what we are doing um, in regards of your business interests. Because if we start doing this, if we start communicating this, there's no independent journalism anymore. Um, with platforms like LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, um, do we still need traditional uh, media outlets, for example, like Bilt. Bilt is transforming into a, 
I don't know, a multi-channel platform kind of media out outlet. They are starting build. They started build um, TV a couple of weeks ago. Um, what do you think of that, and how do you evaluate it? Because yeah, that's. Yeah. Um, as I said before, we don't need uh, we don't need uh, newspapers anymore. At the end, I don't think uh, a lot of newspapers will survive. You know, the circulation of Bild Zeitung used to be five million sold copies a day, five million. Uh, nowadays it's still 1.4 million, but it's only 1.4 million. But with all digital outlets and all digital channels, uh, the, build of, uh, uh, the reach of build, uh, the brand build, is nowadays bigger than it has ever been before. Because, you know, on, on paper you would reach only a certain amount of the audience. You would never reach people under the age of 14 because you know the first contact to build like 40 years ago was when you were an apprentice uh, on a construction site or a soldier. Nowadays because they are on the platform TikTok they reach out to kids from the age of 10 or 12 uh, and that is a big chance if you do it in the right way. You've got a big chance if you understand yourself not as a paper or a TV station but as a media brand that has got a uh, certain promise for your user. It's about information, it's about entertaining, it's about exciting, it's about excellence, it's about competence. So one of the promises of BUILD is that nobody else uh, does report as accurate about soccer as BUILD. You know, whatever is new in the soccer world, you will first read in BUILD. So, and if you take that promise seriously, then it's only a question of what kind of um, platforms do I use to meet my user? I have to be where my user is. Uh, in the old world, you know, Build was always great in addressing the user. So when we found out that our people in summer times would go to Spain and spend their holidays in Mallorca, we started printing newspapers in Mallorca. We built a printing factory over there to serve hundreds and thousands of tourists in Mallorca and serve them with the Spanish weather. When suddenly, uh, you know, bakeries were allowed to open on, um, uh, on Sundays, we made sure to be there, you know, with uh, uh, the fresh brötchen. And when we found out that people would not be, you know, in former times, life in the west of Germany started at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning at a kiosk with a cigarette uh, and a coffee. And we found out that people would not be there anymore, but would start being at Aldi at 9 o'clock when they opened the super supermarkets, we started selling the newspaper over there in the analog world. And today, as a media company, you just have to do the same. Be where the user is, and I still believe you need, you need journalists to check the incination of all the people that incinate now themselves, if it's politicians, if it's companies, if it's sport clubs on social media. From a company perspective, why should you talk to Build again or still? Um, I mean, you said it yourself. Um, a couple of uh, DAX um, CEOs use uh, LinkedIn nowadays. Um, they can send out their own messages without a gatekeeper and everything. So, so why should they talk to traditional media? Um, in Germany, there's a very simple reason for that. The demography. Again, me. Because there are uh, so many, you know, still so many of us and that we, when we learn how to use uh, special media, that you know, there's still an audience that likes to read it in Bild or in, in the Handelsblatt. Uh, in, in countries like the US, in countries like Turkey, very different. You know, that's why there are many uh, uh, cities in, in, in the US that don't have any newspaper at all any longer. So something is changing over there, but we see new media outlets. You're not talking to Bild anymore, but you're talking nowadays to Gabor Steingart. So, for example, I recommend to my CEOs, I always recommend, if you've got the chance to talk to Gabor Steingart, do it, because he's got like uh, 300,000 subscribers for his newsletters, and it's just the right audience. It's just the right audience to be there. It makes sense. So, you know, the news outlets change, and it can be a, uh, it can be uh, talking about uh, podcast, uh, Philip Westermeyer, OMR, online marketing rock stars. It became the place to be if you want to do a long talk and do something different. It's not, you don't go to, the, to RBB anymore. 
uh, to any radio station you go to OMR. So it is changing. It is uh, changing the outlets. It's not the typical media company anymore. If the media company is doing a good, a good job, they try to hire these people, they try to get them into their system, like uh, Axel Springer, my mother company at Bild, they bought a big stake in uh, um, Gabo Steingart's uh, business, simply to see what, are, what is the new media evolving in the new world. So it's kind of all elite. Pardon? Most of what you just mentioned is elite projects. I mean, Gabo Steingart is not something uh, a regular family in the countryside listens to us. Same with LinkedIn. I mean, if you are a professional, I mean, you show your CV there. Yeah, there again, is not I the typical guy who did the Ausbildung. He's not on LinkedIn. Yeah, um, so we have, again, we have to um, um, make a difference between Germany and Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, for example, of course, you've got the um, something like Huffington Post uh, is extremely successful in the United States, and it is not about elites. Something like BuzzFeed is extremely successful in the United States. Why is it not successful over here? Because we were too fast, you know. Because uh, um, uh, the um, we had the chance, as you said before, everything that happens in the U.S. is coming to us with a time lag of three years. So we could actually see what is going to happen to classical media in the U.S and then reacting, because in the US, the classical media said, why should I give away my content for free in the web if I can still sell newspapers? And the answer was very simple, because there were some uh, new companies that would you know, uh, capture the digital space that was open above them, and uh, so we learned to cannibalize ourselves before somebody else did it. And this is, for example, why there is no successful BuzzFeed in Germany, why there is no successful um, um, uh, having post in Germany because we did it ourselves. We built these digital uh, platforms. We, we, we gave away our content. We made sure that nobody else is taking our, uh, away our core, our, our brand, our promise in the digital world. We did it ourselves. That is, for example, why we accelerated the decline of the circulation on purpose. Because we said, you know, um, I can still take a lot of money out, out of selling paper. It's really, really makes a lot of money. But we won't have a life in the long run. Somebody else is going to take it. We have to make sure that we own the digital world for our brand as well. Yeah, we have already... Uh, yes. It's already over time. So, but are there any uh, further questions? Um, Okay, we, we take one more question and then yeah. we wrap it up. Can you hear me? It's like to continue the uh, conversation you which you were just talking about that uh, digital technology and like social media and all of that were developed like in Europe or USA or let's say like first world country. But what to do with the rest? Uh, for example, when about this case in India when people were killing other people just because they read something in WhatsApp. How, like when technology mean, meets uh, not so developed society, how to deal with that? What do you think about this? Uh, first of all, uh, none of these platforms were developed in Europe, unfortunately. They were all developed either in the United States or in Asia, uh, especially in China. So we are the, uh, we don't have anything. We don't own anything. We are just the side bystanders and can uh, um, talk about it. Uh, you know, with, um, I compare technology always to a knife. Um, I, with a knife, I can make my uh, wife a nice bread with some butter and some marmalade, or I could kill her. Uh, so technology is not bad, uh, uh, good uh, from, from the beginning. It is sometimes, as I said before, difficult with these algorithms, because these algorithms have a purpose. They don't have a purpose, you know, to support the bad. But the, the way the algorithm is constructed, it supports these kind of things. And I'm totally convinced that we have to find solutions for that. Uh, we have to find regulations for that. Again, we are at the beginning of a journey. And we will, uh, and we will see how are they going to react to requests. They already reacted to requests. Um, but at the end, um, I think, for example, the algorithm has to be quite transparent. I would like to understand the algorithm and to know what kind of content is supported by the algorithm. We are still living in a world where we don't have regulations.
for these kind of platforms and we will come to a point where we will find solutions for that. I'm extremely optimistic. I have one last question in regards to that. Um, do you think that Europe should own the rails and build their own platforms or do you think we should um, go into an alliance with um, platforms um, of the US? Where do you think we stand right now with the, given the fact that technology is evolving and developing so quick? Uh, Europe should create its own McDonald's and its own Coca-Cola. It's a question of the customer and it's where the customer goes. And uh, you, you know, you can't order that we are going to build our own Google. We tried to do it. We tried. We, there was an awful lot of money into a Google European project. Where did it go to? Nothing. It's simply a question of what does the customer like. And the customer is the most important force in that regards. Thank you. Thank you.